You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. This is the Useless Information Podcast. I am Steve Silverman. Useless Information. So this past winter while I was exercising, I was watching some TV shows that I DVR'd, and I became captivated by the three-part American Experience broadcast of Robert Stone's movie Chasing the Moon. If you didn't see it, it is highly recommended. And not only was it educational, but it was simply amazing to watch. Yet, I couldn't help but notice that it missed one crucial part of the race to the moon. Most people have been taught that it was a two-way race between the Soviet Union and the United States to get a man to first step on that lunar surface. But there was a third nation that has largely been overlooked in its effort to be first. That was the country of Zambia. Now, Zambia is not exactly the first country that comes to mind when one thinks about space exploration. But in the first part of the 1960s, their space program was grabbing headlines worldwide. Now, I may be going out on a limb here, but I suspect that many people would be hard-pressed to find Zambia on a map. I think most people know it's in Africa, but other than that, they couldn't find it. So let me just give you a little hint if you're not sure. It's located in the south-central portion of Africa, and Zambia is completely landlocked from the ocean. To its north, you have the Democratic Republic of Congo, you know, the DRC, and then as you move clockwise around Zambia, you will find Tanzania and Malawi to the east, Zimbabwe, then Botswana, and a very small sliver of Namibia to the south, and then finally Angola lies to its west. The first Europeans to set foot in the region were members of an expedition that was led by Portuguese explorer Francisco de Lacerda in the late 1700s. Of course, other Europeans would follow in the 19th century, the most famous of whom was Dr. Livingstone, who was forever immortalized by that classic phrase, Dr. Livingstone. I presume. By the late 1800s, the British South Africa Company, led by Cecil Rhodes, moved in to exploit the mineral resources of the region. And by the 1920s, what is Zambia today, that region would become part of the British Empire and officially known as Northern Rhodesia. Then, with the outbreak of World War II, the British recruited young African men to fight in the King's African Rifles Unit. But after the war ended, and having fought for the freedom of Europe, these same exact men returned home to a land where they did not enjoy the same freedoms. They wanted their own country. One of these men was Edward Festus Makuka Nekloso, and he had been born in the northern part of northern Rhodesia. And after having served as a sergeant in the Signal Corps, upon his return from the war, he became a language translator for the Northern Rhodesian government, and he soon turned his focus to his true love. That was the teaching of science. But he quickly had a fallout with the educational authorities, so he decided to open his own school. But the colonial government quickly shut it down, So Nicoloso became enraged and he spent the next decade fighting for his homeland's independence. He used his knowledge of science to build bombs and other weapons, and of course this didn't go over too well with the authorities. And as a result, Nicoloso was arrested and imprisoned between 1956 and 1957. Finally, on October 24th, 1964, colonial rule officially came to an end. The new country was named Zambia after the Zambezi River, which flowed through it, and Nicoloso secured a job as the Lusaka Rent and Repairs Association organizer. I honestly have no idea what that job entails. Yet his true passion was still science, and he immediately established the National Academy of Science, Space Research, and philosophy. His goal was simple, to place a man on the moon before the United States or the Soviet Union did so. Their motto was, where fate and glory lead, 
we are always there. The news of Zambia's Luna ambitions would break in the world news just days after the country's independence. It was now a three-way race to the moon. He stated, quote, I see the Zambia of the future as a space-age Zambia, more advanced than Russia or America. In fact, in my Academy of Sciences, our thinking is already six or seven years ahead of both powers. When questioned as to why he wanted to go to the moon, the closest stated, Because it is there. Is that not so? He continued, It is not like the clouds. I've been on an airplane during the war and one can fly through the clouds. It is a solid body hanging in the sky. And we are solid bodies, so we must be able to reach it. Is that not so? On May 25, 1961, United States President John F. Kennedy stood before Congress and famously stated, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. But Nicoloso had even loftier goals. He planned to have the first Zambian astronaut on the moon by the end of 1965. Imagine the prestige value this would earn for Zambia. Most Westerners don't even know whereabouts in Africa we are. And just how he's going to place a man on the moon in such a short amount of time was unclear. You see, details of the Zambian space program were purposely shrouded in mystery. Quote, You cannot trust anyone in a project of this magnitude, he said. Some of our ideas are way ahead of the Americans and Russians, and these days will not let anyone see my rocket plans. Nicoloso estimated that he needed 700 million pounds sterling to reach the lunar surface. That'd be about 1.96 billion American dollars, and adjusted for inflation, that's about 16 billion dollars today. Now, having only raised $2,200 from private donors, he submitted a request to the United Nations for $19 million to finance the early phases of his work. That's about $159 million today. A training facility was set up approximately 7 miles, or 11.2 kilometers, outside of the new nation's capital of Lusaka. Lacking the funds for a full-size rocket, their first test flight involved a spacecraft made from a long copper tube, and to be honest, it looked more like an elongated barrel. And without any rocket fuel, the test launch used the Mukwa propulsion system, which was basically a catapult system. Their first flight landed far short of the moon. It struggled to reach an altitude of, you ready for this, 6 feet, or about 1.83 meters. His initial team consisted of a woman and 10 young men. The closer referred to them as Afronauts. Afronaut number one was Godfrey Mwango, who had completed more spaceman training than anyone else. After Mwango mentioned to a reporter, I'm ready for the Mars flight now, Nicoloso quickly corrected him. The girl is going to Mars. Godfrey, you're going to the moon. <laughs> you heard that correctly. Nicoloso had grander plans than just the moon. He wanted a Zambian to be the first on Mars. Quote, we have been studying the planet through telescopes at our headquarters and are now certain Mars is populated by primitive natives. Our rocket crew is ready. Specially trained space girl Motha Mwamba, two cats, and a missionary will be launching in our first rocket. So just who was Motha Mwamba? Well, she was a 17-year-old young woman with the equivalent of an 8th grade education. And, under Nicoloso's guidance, she had been studying topics like astrophysics, cosmography, geometry, chemistry, and astrobiology as part of her training. Most importantly, she had been caring for 10 cats. So what's the deal with the cats? Nicoloso explained. Partly, they are there to provide her with companionship on the long journey, but primarily they are technological accessories. He continued, when she arrives on Mars, she will open the door of the rocket and drop the cats on the ground. 
If they survive, she will then see that Mars is fit for human habitation. He then turned to Ms. Mwamba and questioned, Is that not so? She replied, Ah, yes, that is so. Astronaut number three was identified as 22-year-old Ruben Simwinga. His future destination in our solar system was still to be determined. That's because Nicolosa was going to figure that out after Ms. Mwamba returned from Mars in their reusable spacecraft. Nicolosa was bold in his vision of sending humans into space, but he didn't see himself ever doing so. Ah, it has been decided that I must not ascend higher than 400 feet. I am needed here to teach. In November of 1964, a TV crew from the UK's ITN, that's Independent Television News, they were dispatched to Zambia to interview Nicoloso. Now, film of him and the astronauts in training can be easily found on YouTube, and I do encourage you to go search it out. Here's a bit of that interview. Mr. Enclosure, is this the site for your rocket launching program? Yes. And, and could you tell me where your rocket is? Yes, this is the rocket launching site, and my rocket is just here. And what is the name of your organization? Uh, the name of my organization is uh, National Academy of Science, Space Research, and Ast Astronomical Research. And what position do you hold in the organization? I'm the Director General of Science, Space Research, and Philosophy. And when will you fire off your first rocket, and where will you send it to? I will, I will fight from Lusaka, and uh, it, it will go straight to the moon. It depends upon how much money I, I got. If I got enough funds, it would be very soon, or in the middle of 1965, if I got enough funds. But if not, well, it will have to make me delay longer. As you could hear, my impression of Nicoloso was spot on. Not. <laughs> anyway, if you'd like to hear the entire interview, just go to YouTube. The exact title of this video is Afronauts colon, Interview with Edward Nicoloso. And Nicoloso is spelled capital N-K-O-L-O-S-O. Now, around the same time that that interview was done, the San Francisco Chronicle dispatched their veteran reporter, that's Arthur Hoppe, to do the same. The series of stories that he wrote on the Zambian space program is perhaps the best documentation that still exists of the entire operation. Hoppe was warmly greeted by Nicoloso. Quote, You've arrived at the most propitious moment. We have just decided which of our 12 assets will have the place of honor in the space capsule for the historic moonshot. It will be Godfrey Mwango here. Nicoloso continued. He has also passed the acid test of any aspiring astronaut. Simulated recovery from the space capsule following a landing on water. That's when Mwango commented. It was a bit fearsome. I cannot swim. Nicoloso continued. Tomorrow, now that he's been chosen, we will redouble our vigorousness of his training program so that Zambia may be the first to plant her flag on the moon. We would be pleased if you would care to watch. Now, if you're imagining a highly sophisticated training facility, you know, like the one that NASA has, Zambia's was the complete opposite. Here's a bit of Hoppy's description of Mwango's first trip in orbit. And I should point out every word I'm about to read that includes a description were Hoppy's words. In fact, when I get back to my narration, I'll let you know. A okay? said Director Nicoloso anxiously, thumping on the steel side of the space capsule. A okay, came back the game if muffled reply. Ten, nine, eight. The final countdown had to be interrupted twice due to technical difficulties. Primarily the difficulty that astronaut Mwango was slightly too large for the barrel, and his head kept hanging out dangerously close to the ground. At last, Mwango scrunched himself into a suitable position, and all details measured up to Director Nicoloso's standards of perfection. Blast off! cried Nicoloso, giving the space capsule a shove with his foot. All systems go! Hoppy continued, The first Zambian astronaut was successfully placed in orbit at 3.14.32 p.m. Central African time. 
Godfrey Mwango, 21, orbited 17 times down a grassy incline in a 40-gallon oil drum before coming to rest against a blue gum tree. Emerging from his capsule unscathed, Mwango blurted out, Man, what a ride! And that's the end of Hoppy's description. When Hoppy asked Nicoloso what he had learned from the test, he replied, Well, for one thing, we're going to have to get a bigger barrel. It should be clear by now that Mwango had never left the ground, and that training to be a Zambian astronaut was nothing like what a typical Russian or American trainee went through. This was as basic as one could get. At an earlier press conference, Nicoloso told reporters, quote, I'm getting them acclimated to space travel by placing them in my space capsule every day. It's a 40-gallon oil drum in which they sit down, and I've been rolling them down the side of a hill. This gives them the feeling of rushing through space. I also make them swing from the end of a long rope. When they reach the highest point, I cut the rope. This produces the feeling of free fall. As a side note, we did something like this when I was a kid. Now, the only difference was that the rope was never cut. We simply swung out and let go, and we always screamed out the Tarzan yell. (laughs) I have to admit, I was never that good. Anyway, by the end of November of 1964, it was clear that Nicoloso was not going to meet his goal of placing a man on the moon any time soon. As a result, the launch date was indefinitely postponed, as if they ever had a chance. Nicoloso blamed this on the shortage of funds. Quote, Technologically, we are well ahead of both the Americans and Russians with the development of our turbulent propulsion engine. But due to cosmic rays, we now find we will need an engine of greater thrust, and this will require more money. And just where was this money going to come from? Well, the United States government, of course. He requested, quote, adequate supplies of liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen and 7,500,000 pounds sterling. That's over $175 million today. He also approached the Israeli government for financial support, and I know you're going to be shocked by this, but both countries remain noncommittal on the funding of the Zambian space program. Yet Nicoloso remained undaunted. Quote, I have the distinct feeling that our program will not be delayed too long for lack of funds. Yes, please, I think I may say that with the help of our many, many friends, Zambia shall be the first to the moon. Nicoloso's first real rocket was being named the DKLO-1. That was in honor of their first president, David Kayunda. But he was still without rocket fuel, so he proposed using dynamite as a propellant, But of course, that idea was quickly vetoed by authorities. So he turned his focus to the newer Mulolo system. Quote, Mulolo is the word for swinging. We have tied ropes to tall trees and then swing our astronauts slowly out into space. Thus far, we have achieved a distance of 10 yards. That's about 9.1 meters. But of course, by lengthening the rope, we could go further. When asked by Hoppy if he was planning to use the Malolo system to go to the moon, Nicoloso replied, Oh no, that unfortunately has its limits, but the Zambia Flying Club is aspiring to join forces with us. They are thinking of building a glider. Then too, we are expecting to consolidate our program with the Zambian Air Force. When questioned as to what propulsion system they were now focused upon, he replied, Turbulent propulsion! But please, I can say no more at the present time. National prestige is involved. We must beat Russia and America to the moon. What they can do, we can do also. As Hoppy was preparing to head back home, Nicoloso informed him that he also would be leaving shortly. He was headed north to the mining community of Nadola to put Mwangu through what he called stoical training. He said, quote, There is a mining shaft up there 400 feet deep filled with water. We will throw him in. It wasn't long after this that each of his astronauts would begin to leave the Zambian space program. Nicoloso explained, 
After the worldwide television showing impressed publicity of our astronauts in training, I received thousands of letters from foreign countries. But my spacemen thought that they were film stars. They demanded payment and refused to continue with our program of rolling down hills in oil drums and my special tree-swinging method of simulating space weightlessness. Their star astronaut Martha Mwamba got pregnant and her parents talked her out of continuing with her space training. Nicoloso added, Two of my best men went on a drinking spree a month ago and haven't been seen since. Another of my assets has joined the local tribal song and dance group. He says he makes more money swinging from the top of a 40-foot pole. Even after Neil Armstrong became the first man to walk on the moon, Nicoloso refused to give up on his dream. He promised that a Zambian will walk on the moon sooner than people think. Nicoloso would go on to serve as President Kayunda's special representative to the African Liberation Center, which was the headquarters for all the freedom movements that were working to overthrow the remaining colonized nations in Africa. He also unsuccessfully ran to be the mayor of Lusaka. Finally, in 1983, 59-year-old Nicoloso was awarded a law degree from the University of Zambia. He passed away on March 4th of 1989 and was buried with presidential honors. Now, the jury's still out as to whether Nicoloso was serious or it was all one big joke. Some have even suggested that the Zambian space program was really a cover for the training of his freedom fighters. In 1970, Phineas Masukwa, who was the acting press officer for the Zambian embassy in Washington, D.C. at the time, he told the press, quote, This was publicized very widely here in America about two years ago, but he has not done anything along that line for some time. Mr. Nicoloso is actually a very well-read person. It was a big joke. Honestly, I have to agree with his assessment. It was an ingenious prank that Nicoloso pulled on the world, and it was beautifully executed and very nicely done. And if nothing else, he made the world smile for a brief moment, and quite possibly a few people may have finally learned where Zambia is located. Useless, useful, I'll leave that for you to decide. Boys and girls, if you want to do thrilling, adventurous things like your favorite detective Dick Tracy does, just remember that detective work takes plenty of energy. Your most exciting thing takes energy. Baseball, football, swimming. It's the boys and girls with plenty of energy who win out at all those. And listen, one really fast way to get energy is just by eating delicious chocolatey Pepsi rolls. But just one Tootsie Roll alone gives you more energy units than you use hiking a whole mile. And there's no long waiting for that energy either. Tootsie Rolls change into energy almost as fast as lightning. And what more Tootsie Rolls are made with good wholesome milk. And you know what a wonderful bodybuilder that is. So next time you have a nickel for candy, get the three-in-one value. Energy plus food value plus fun. Get chocolatey long-lasting Tootsie Rolls. Get a big jumbo size Tootsie Roll for only a nickel. Or any time you have only a penny, get the fun to eat penny size. Either way, you sure get a lot for your money in a Tootsie Roll. And now, Dick Tracy. That commercial for Tootsie Rolls from the October 6, 1943 episode of Dick Tracy. This particular episode was titled Doc Benson is Released by the DA and Escapes. Of course, the radio show was based upon the incredibly popular newspaper comic strip of the same name, which had debuted on Sunday, October 4th of 1931 in the Detroit Mirror. The comic strip was written and drawn by Chester Gould, who would continue doing that until his retirement on December 25th of 1977, at which point other artists assumed his role. The radio show began a successful run in 1934 on NBC radio stations throughout the New England region. A short time later, on February 4, 1935, the show was picked up for national syndication by CBS at Switch Networks. Each episode ran 15 minutes in length, and new episodes were broadcast four times weekly. It then moved to the mutual broadcasting system for a couple of years before returning to NBC on January 3rd of 1938. 
In 1939, the show was expanded to a half hour, but production of the show came to a halt with the outbreak of World War II. It would stay on hiatus until the ABC Blue Network picked it up for Saturday broadcasts. After all, it was a kid's show, beginning on March 15th of 1943. That run would last to July 16th of 1948, with, as you heard, Tootsie Roll as its sponsor. The story of Tootsie Roll began with a poor Austrian immigrant named Leo Hirschfeld who arrived in New York City in 1884. Now, according to the Tootsie Roll Industries company History, Hirschfeld began to sell Tootsie Rolls in his small Brooklyn candy store in 1896. Unfortunately, others have done further research into the subject and concluded this is a bit of an exaggeration. The main problem is that in 1896, Hirschfeld had been living in Manhattan, not Brooklyn, and he was working for a candy manufacturer named Stern and Salberg. Basically, Julius Stern and Jacob Salberg were his employers. He didn't own his own candy store. Hirschfeld's first significant creation while working at Stern and Salberg was to formulate a new product with the peculiar name of Bromangelin Jelly Powder. In other words, it was a gelatin dessert similar to Jell-O. Now surprisingly, even with that strange name, this product proved to be quite successful and was a large part of Stern and Salberg's business at the turn of the 20th century. To promote Bromangel and the company printed booklets that featured a cute little girl named Tatling Tootsie as its spokesmodel. Tootsie just happened to be the nickname of Leo Hirschfeld's little daughter, Clara. It was in May of 1907 that Hirschfeld applied for a patent for a new candy-making process for a treat that would be called, you guessed it, the Tootsie Roll. Stern and Salberg began selling Tootsie Rolls in September of 1908, not in 1896, and while Hirschfeld had invented the treat, it was the financial backing and promotion by Stern and Salberg that made Tootsie Rolls a smash hit. In 1917, Stern and Salberg was rechristened the Sweets Company of America. By this time, Stern and Salberg had both retired from the business, and while Hirschfeld had been responsible for creating the products that made the company so successful, he was not placed in charge of the new company. So he chose to leave the firm, and he started the Mills Candy Corporation in 1920, but that new venture soon failed. With his wife in a sanatorium and Hirschfeld himself supposedly suffering from some sort of stomach disease, he sadly shot himself to death on January 13, 1922, in his room at the Monterey Hotel, which was located at 94th Street and Broadway in Manhattan. He left a note for his attorney that simply stated, I'm sorry, but I couldn't help it. So here's a question for you. Can you name the only United States president who spoke English as a second language? Now to help you narrow down your choices, I'll give you a hint in that it's one of the first 10 presidents of the United States. Well, hang around for a bit and I'll let you know the answer at the end of this podcast. In other news, here are three stories in which someone, basically the bad guy, got the last laugh. In our first story, which was reported on January 10th of 1930, 45 year old Claude Record informed Denver, Colorado police that, as an out of town visitor, he was surprised to see just how many speakeasies there were. He was so sure of himself that he told them that he could lead them to half a dozen speakeasies in just 10 minutes. So a deal was made. Record would go in undercover and he'd make a purchase using $2 that they provided him with. That's about $31 today. As he emerged from each speakeasy, the deal was that he'd meet up with patrolman George Hart, who was waiting in a nearby alley. So Officer Hart waited and waited in the freezing cold for his snitch to bring him the evidence. Five minutes went by, then 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. After waiting close to an hour, Hart concluded that something had gone wrong, and he proceeded to the hotel where Wrecker was staying. And that's where he found Record drunk in his room and the $2 long gone. He was jailed for questioning. Sadly, I couldn't find any follow-up story to find out what actually happened to him. Next up, on November 20th of 1950, 
a man with a revolver entered Milt's food market in Chicago just prior to their closing for the evening. He demanded all of the money from the cash register. That's when Mrs. Renee Biliak, the proprietor's wife, slammed the cash register closed and informed the thief that the register was self-locking. She claimed to be unable to access the contents of the register. So the thief opted for the next best thing and ordered her to hand over her purse. And that was exactly what she did. After the thief exited the premises, Mrs. Biliak summoned her husband Milton and explained how she had outsmarted the thief. That's when her husband gave her the bad news. You see, just prior to the robbery, he had taken the money out of the register and placed it into her purse for safekeeping. And in our last story for today, it was reported on August 11, 1959, that Fred Ernst, who was the owner of the California Copy Corporation in Los Angeles, California, had three photocopy machines stolen two weeks prior. At the time of the theft, Ernst told the police, quote, They can't use the machines because no one else in Los Angeles has photocopy paper for those units. Now, he may have thought he had gotten the last laugh, but in the end, the thieves did. They once again broke into his business, and this time they stole $1,000 worth of that specially sized photocopy paper. Adjusted for inflation, that's about $9,000 today, not including how much he lost on the machines themselves. So earlier I'd asked you who was the first U.S. president who spoke English as a second language. Did you know the answer? Well, it was the eighth president of the United States, Martin Van Buren, who served from 1837 through 1841. Prior to that, he was the ninth governor of New York State, the 10th United States Secretary of State, and he was the 8th Vice President of the United States under Andrew Jackson. Now, Van Buren was born into a Dutch-speaking home in Kinderhook, New York. He learned to speak English while attending school, and he was the first United States President born after the American Revolution, making him the first truly American citizen to become President. All previous Presidents had formerly been British subjects. For your reference, Kinderhook, New York lies approximately 20 miles or 32 kilometers south of Albany, New York, and it lies just east of the Hudson River. In the past, it was commonly referred to as Old Kinderhook, or OK for short. And while no one can say with any certainty, many researchers claim that this is where the term OK originated. Now, I've driven through Kinderhook many times over the years, and that's mainly because the school I taught in for the past 30 years was just a short drive away. But surprisingly, I've never been inside his retirement home there, which is now a National Historic Site. Oddly, I had the promotional brochure on my nightstand this past winter, and I told my wife we definitely needed to go visit it this summer. Of course, that's not going to happen because it's closed due to the coronavirus. Well, that brings another episode of the Useless Information Podcast to a close. Just a reminder that my new book, The Flipside History, will soon be released. And while I haven't heard anything from the publisher recently, I did notice on Amazon that the release date has been changed to August 14th. It was originally July 14th. Now, the Kindle version is already available for download, but the print edition, of course, has not been released. Uh, but if you want to pre-order it there, you can. I did receive some copies of the book about 10 days ago, and I have to say, it looks great. I like it a lot better than my first two books. Just a general reminder to be sure to sign up for my Twitter feed. It's at Useless Infocast. That's at Useless Infocast. And it'll make you among the first to know when a new episode is released. Also, be sure to like the show on Facebook. You can just do a quick search for the Useless Information podcast there, and it should pop up. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, TuneIn, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Now, I was painting the ceiling of my back porch last week, and I was able to pull up this podcast uh, on my Alexa device. So I quickly recorded it. So here's how I did it. Alexa, play the Useless Information Podcast. Here's Useless Information Podcast from Apple Podcasts. Playing the latest episode, The Child Bride. This is the Useless Information Podcast. Alexa, pause. Alexa, continue. 
Resuming Useless Information Podcast from Apple Podcasts, The Child Bride. And that's it. Of course, I'm not listening to myself all the time. I'd listen to other podcasts, but it's very easy to do. Anyway, thanks again for listening. I hope you tune in the next time. Take care, everyone. Bye.